Welcome to the Three Minute Thesis Challenge from the NSSR. Woo. The crowd is ready. The judges are ready. Are the contestants up to the task? We will find out momentarily. Uh, I want to welcome you all. This is, uh, as we know from clicking on our website, the most innovative university in the world. And uh, it's a place where it's almost impossible to innovate. And I, I just want to thank the very innovative staff that has brought us here tonight. Suya Yi, of course, Jennifer, PJ, Sherry, Roberto. Big hand for all of them. To the contestants, good luck. I will say that uh, you are, as you walk in this room, uh, developing a really important skill, which I think everybody who goes through this process of graduate school needs to develop, which is the really short, brief, meaningful exposition of the importance and meaning of their work. And so that is the challenge tonight. At the same time, good luck. At the same time, uh, you know, I do remember when I was first asked in the elevator to explain my dissertation, and it, it <laughs> I, I don't remember exactly what I said, but it was something like this. I think you'll do wonderfully tonight. I'm sure of it. You're well prepared by the staff, and uh, your friends are here to support you. I'm so happy to see it. It's going to be a lot of fun. Have fun. Was that beer that? Fun. Beer, vote, thank you. Have a great night. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to the first ever and maybe annual, I don't know, three minute thesis at the NSSR. So, my name is PJ Gore. I'm going to be Ryan Seacrest tonight. Um, so, before we get to the competition, I'm going to go ahead and just explain to you a little bit of the format and the rules. So, the three-minute thesis is a research communication competition that was developed at the University of Queensland. I think that's in Australia. Uh, Australia. So, graduate students have three minutes to present their research and its relevance. Uh, and it's an exercise in consolidating one's ideas and findings in a kind of digestible form for non-specialists. So this is going to be the task. Today, our three judges are uh, Vice Dean Robert Kostreva. <laughs> Professor Shannon Madden from Anthropology. And Alyssa Thompson, uh, MA in Philosophy and co-chair of GS GFSS. So here are the rules. So each student, uh, each of the nine contestants will have one static PowerPoint slide and nothing else, no other electronic media and no other props. Um, they'll give a three-minute presentation of their thesis uh, and its relevance and, uh, and its impact. And any overage is an automatic disqualification. So Taya will be uh, timing them. So I'm sorry to put you out there. You're the time, you're the time lord. Um, nobody watches Dr. Who. OK. <laughs> the presentations will be given orally. Um, and the presentations begin after the kind of short Mic check, so just to make sure that um, the lav mics uh, are catching. And then as soon as that, uh, the sort of tests, Roberto's going to help out with that, uh, the students begin. And the judges' de decisions are final. <laughs> There's no you know, makeups, no appeals. No, or if you want, go ahead and email the appeals committee. That'll take a while. Uh, <laughs> Okay, sorry. Okay, so here's some a little bit about the judging criteria. There are basically two areas. The first is comprehension and content. So basically, the students will be tasked uh, at giving, within three minutes again, an adequate background and significance of their research. Uh, they'll sort of be judged on their ability to sort of uh, avoid jargon uh, and to sort of present their uh, research uh, for a non-specialist audience. So maybe that's not everyone in here. Maybe just Robert. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, they will be sort of judged on their ability to sort of display the kind of impact and the importance of their findings to sort of make sure that they present it clearly. 
uh, that there's a kind of clear logic to their presentation, um, and where there are many components or various aspects to sort of balance them correctly and to sort of present them and give them their own time. Aside from comprehension and content, the, the contestants will also be judged on engagement and communication. So did they pique your curiosity? Did they avoid overgeneralizing? Um, meaning were they specific enough? Were they enthusiastic, captivating? Did they have a stage presence? Um, and the, the kind of use of their PowerPoint slide, did they make good use of it? In terms of prizes, there's a first, second, and third place. So first place wins $1,000, second, 750, and third, 300. And then, this is where you all come in. At the end, there's an audience choice uh, for 500. And just to let you know that, you know, say for example, somebody gets first place, they can also get the audience choice. So like somebody can walk out <laughs> with a lot of moolah. With that said, we'll go ahead and begin. So I ask that everybody sort of remain uh, quiet during the kind of three minutes. And whenever the first contestant is ready, which will be uh, Mohamed El Batran from Economics. When I applied to the new school back six years ago, uh, I was mainly concerned with the conditions of the rural uh, labor in my country and small family uh, farms that's in Egypt. Uh, the general question I posed really is why is half of the rural population living in extreme poverty? That's 28 million people living on under $1.50 a day. So small family farms in Egypt, we call them fallahin in Arabic, they supply all the agricultural labor and they also supply most of the food that is consumed domestically. They are alienated from decision making and they are considered very inefficient. Now, my experience with them was very different. I argued that um, the main source of food security is fallahin, and my thesis would focus on two agricultural clusters in the Western Desert. Uh, in 2012-2013, while working for exporting farms, I lived with the fallahin of the Tahrir province. The labor powering the Tahrir export facilities were women, young fallahin women between the ages of 16 and 26 that worked for about six years uh, doing seasonal labor to save primarily for marriage and then they retired in their mid-20s. Uh, the informal economy that they uh, worked under had them suffer from oppressed wages and almost absolutely no protective labor rights. Uh, their families got minimal knowledge of technology spillovers because they lack financing and they lack uh, market knowledge. Convinced that a better livelihood comes from exporting low nutrition foods to Europe, they are slowly abandoning their subsistence culture. So I decided to conduct field research and a pilot project to answer the following questions. One, can value Allahim farms and be awarded in the domestic market? Two, can they raise their incomes while sustaining their crop diversity? My hypothesis is they do have the knowledge to upgrade their product and they can actually do that while sustaining their subsistence culture. And when they do that, they can increase both their incomes and their well-being. In 2017, I moved to Al Hayes Oasis of the Western Desert. It's an ancient oasis uh, southwest of Cairo. It has about 600 households, mainly relying on the production of palm days for their, uh, for their livelihoods. Unlike most fallahin, they actually stuck to their subsistence culture. And that's why their children don't have to work and they don't suffer from malnutrition and all of them go to school. Uh, the pilot project sold their dates <clears throat> at 1,000% markup from the farm gate profits. And uh, since then, I relocated twice from New York to Egypt, each time for seven months. If you think moving to bed thigh saves rent money, try the Western Desert. Uh, in 2018, using the money I saved from not living here, we built a small processing facility and a cold storage space in the Oasis to be used cooperative, cooperatively by the farmers. They really reinforce my belief that fallahin are capable of designing their own development needs. Market empowerment should only be supplementary to their sustenance-driven socioeconomic traditions, and these are really the protective cushions against inevitable market failures. Finally, uh, I just want to share a fun fact. Uh, equal pay encouraged women's participation, and they saved our produce twice. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. So as we're making the switch, um, so for those of you who are compelled already at this early stage, Mohammed El Batran, right? So if you want. All right. So next we have Stephen Furch from sociology. <laughs> Here we 
you hear it? Check, check, one, two. All right, awesome. So, despite all my rage, I am still just a rat in a cage. With these words, Billy Corgan, lead singer of the Smashing Pumpkins, summed up what a lot of us probably perceive in our daily lives, a lack of subjective agency. Now, when I mean subjective agency, I mean what is colloquially referred to as free will. Now, when we were talking about this, and in my research I found this a lot, is that many people perceive that they don't have a large amount of agency over their immediate surroundings. They don't really have the ability to change what is what I consider the social construct of reality. But I'm here today to tell you that free will is definitely enmeshed with the social construct of reality. Through this concept of intersubjectivity, uh, it's actually a Hegelian term, intersubjectivity is basically the agreement between two subjective parties or two individuals on what is objectively true. And this is what forms the social construct of reality. Now, what I discuss in a lot of my research is the concept of broadening what we perceive as our objective reality, or what we consider reality as possible. And this is entirely confined within the subjective concepts that we process socially through these intersubjective bonds. So this is what I title near objectivity. Near objectivity is where we expand what we consider the social construct of reality. These are the people that are working on quantum physics, they're working on social, you know, they are actually broadening how we perceive and how we define what is objective within our parameters. Now, are these people normal? That, that's the question. Do, can we say that they are? There's a large amount of people who fall within the lines of what is socially constructed and what is typically perceived as objective. But there are also near objective, I like to title them willful leaders, a lot of people might call these memory workers or some other concept, where these people are actually broadening how we perceive our objective reality by defining what it means to be going against the social construct. Now, when we start talking about subjective agency then, you know, these willful leaders, they can change how we perceive things by challenging them. And that is where the individual's agency lies. You know, because we all worry about how much free will we truly have. So how can we really say that we have an impact if it's socially constructed? We construct our objective reality. We create what we perceive. And that is the power of the individual agent. And that is the power each and one of you have. Thank you. We have Alyssa Boguslav, also from sociology. So. In 2008, Kosovo's political leaders made a deal. They could unilaterally declare independence from Serbia, be recognized by a majority of world countries, and join organizations like the EU, UN, and NATO, as long as they adhered to the international community's prescriptions for state building, including strict rules for the designs of their new state symbols. Designed to represent Kosovo as a young, multi-ethnic democracy with European aspirations, the new flag bears striking resemblance to the flag of the EU. The National Monument is an 80-foot steel sculpture of the English word newborn. The anthem is called Europe, and it has no official lyrics. Today, Kosovo's European future is nowhere in sight. Serbia, backed by Russia, continues to deny Kosovo's statehood, blocking its membership in international organizations. Almost sovereign, Citizens are excluded from their own democracy. Poverty is widespread, political corruption and organized crime are rampant, and strict visa policies make it difficult for most citizens to even leave. A 2014 study found that less than a third of citizens identified with their new state symbols. But what struck me was how attitudes have recently begun to shift, ever since Kosovo began participating in international sport. Suddenly, everyone started to love our anthem, our flag, a local pub owner recounts. What I wanted to know was, how? My dissertation follows the changing meanings of Kosovo symbols through a series of different power struggles, from the UN-sponsored design competition for the flag and anthem to the arena of international competitive judo. 
The findings illuminate that citizens shifting attitudes have nothing to do with the intended meanings of the symbols, but instead emerge from a pattern of recruitment, exclusion, and subversion among the actors. International organizations set the rules, local politicians misinterpret them, and individual citizens left out of, yet necessary to, the making of the Kosovo state, break them. Citizens subvert their exclusion by pranking the newborn monument, covering the bottom of letter B in black spray paint to respell the words new porn. They subvert their exclusion by repeatedly refusing to participate in judo matches in Russia. And they subvert their exclusion by fleeing the country in a mass exodus. The international organizations and local elites who appear to monopolize control instead find themselves caught up in an endless battle over logistics, defeating their own political agendas. Current sociological theories do not value or account for the power of those who appear to be powerless. But my research provides a new approach. It demonstrates that Kosovo citizens are not almost sovereign, they're free. Thank you. I should mention something that I forgot, that if you're going to post anything on social media, the hashtag is <laughs> NSSR3MT. All right, so next we have Yishuan Zhou from politics. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Yi Chuan Zhou. I come from China. Uh, uh, the, the project I want to share with you is actually based on my empirical observation. Actually, we all, we all know that since 1978, China under, uh, goes through a very rapid economic uh, growth under the leadership of Deng Xiaoping. But actually, from many scholars' view, in this process, China is also, uh, was also being deeply, deeply sized. And, uh, but actually, currently, a group of young people in China arouse our attention, especially the intellectuals from the Western society. And they are actually very young. They come from Chinese university, as you can see from this photo. The photo was taken in the August last year. But many of them went to Shenzhen, the largest uh, cities in China, when they tried to support the local labor. And uh, they occupied the city plaza in order to mobilize the sympathy from the citizens. Now, as you can see, Actually, this girl, Yue Xin, she actually she even wrote a letter to Xi Jinping in order to arouse the attention from Central Committee. And uh, actually, so for, for me, the reason why I want to investigate in, into this group of young people is, is that uh, they are actually totally different from the previous generation of the uh, activists in China because all of them are very young. They were born after 1980s and 1990s. So personally, none of them experienced 1989 Tiananmen Event Movement. And some of them were even studying in the Western countries. So they are actually deeply influenced by the Western knowledge of social science. And the, the interesting thing is, they didn't see, the, they actually they don't see the party as the enemy. Because uh, like Rui Xin, she used to write a letter to Xi Jinping. They believe that actually the, the, the party just betrayed the idea of the socialism. And the, the party just abandoned the workers and peasants. So I think they tried to remind the top leader of the party of the importance of the workers. And uh, just like Carl Schmitt writing his little book, Theory of a Partisan, compared with the Communist, Com Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the particularity of Chinese Communist Party is that the party stands very closely with the workers and the peasants. However, as China becomes wealthy, it seems that the gap between the party and the local laborers becomes larger than before. So it seems that they actually, they, they just like the early leader of the of Chinese Communist Party in the 1920s, and they try to stand close with the labor and the farmers. So it seems that what, what, what we are seeing in China nowadays is the battle between the revolutionary parties represented by these young people against the bureaucratic party represented by the Jinping's team. So what I want to show you, just like I said, this year is 2019. It's very special for China. It's 100th anniversary of May 1st movement, 30th anniversary of the M incident movement. So they are very young. I think they actually they represent the future of, of China. So it is important us to understand how they think of China and how they think of the Chinese Communist Party. So that's actually my research project. Thank you. Next, we have Feng Chen from Sociology. 
Testing, testing, testing. Hi, everyone. My name is Fan Chan. I'm from the Department of Sociology, New School for Social Research. My research is a comparative study between two generations of Chinese visual artists in New York City. First, Ai Weiwei and his peers, who were born from 1946 to 1964. And the second is millennials. The research question of my study is how the two generations of Chinese visual artists differ in their strategies to gain recognition in New York City. The reason for my study is um, during the past four decades, China transformed from a poor country to a major power and features the second largest economy in the world. Yet what we don't know is beyond the tremendous development of economy and technology, how culture shifts in the past decade. Does culture revive with economic growth uh, or is culture uh, constrained by the upsurge of state power and market power? The answers remain ambiguous. In this sense, my study uh, will, uh, will offer an approach to the di discuss the cultural transformation by looking at the generational differences in career strategies and life chances of individual cultural practitioners and participants, namely artists from China. Why do they come to China? Uh, why do they come to New York City? Uh, what does it mean to gain recognition here and how did they make it? The significance of my study is to call for more attention to culture as a social force. In this era, particularly features strongman politics, new liberal economy, digital and innovation, and also a stratified society. Do we still believe in power of the culture in contrast to other strong social forces? As a prominent component of culture, art offers me a significant um, a site to uh, explore the social issue. This year is the centennial of the new school, and it's the right time for us to review the legacy of our alumni. As one of a distinguished uh, alumna, alumnus, Ai Weiwei is the most influential artist in his time. However, in the 1990s, no one would have noticed him hustling in the East Village uh, after he dropped out of school from Parsons. <laughs> um, today, more and more young people come over to New York City with their dream uh, to become artists from China. Uh, in the post Ai Weiwei era, what are they engaging with? What are their, um, how do they build up their uh, social network? And uh, do they shine or hide their uh, cultural membership in their artworks? Um, my study will offer more grounding nuances and narratives to the discussion. Thank you. Next, we have Amy Osika from Historical Studies. Satire has an intimate connection with the most disreputable aspects of society. It aims to unearth the corruptions buried beneath comforting social norms, structures, and expectations. So it should be no surprise that during the 60s, one of the most contentious periods of American history, satire resurfaced. Most of it was marked by significant doses of what's called black humor and mocking the seemingly upright mainstream society as riddled with cancerous amounts of absurdity, stupidity, and violence. So the targets of the satire, being the American government and society at large, rejected the critiques as dangerous attempts to undermine the moral civility of society. The counterculture, however, embraced the critique as the irreverent style, as a method of truth-telling, uh, especially towards America's hypocrisy. As the Vietnam War progressed and opposition to it intensified, the humor of the satire began to take a darker turn. At the 1969 Woodstock Festival, the band Country Joe and the Fish performs their infamous I Feel Like I'm Fixing to Die rag. Describing the young men being sent off to die and make their parents proud, Singer lands the fatal punchline, be the first one on your block to have your boy come home in a box. For the counterculture, Vietnam had come to symbolize the irrational violence integral to upholding the American way of life. The terrors of McCarthyism, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the Vietnam War all testified to the expendable nature of even the most loyal of citizens in a society that upheld destruction as the method for salvation. 
despite its morbid sentiments, this humor contains a grain of hope. That through resistance, even in the bleakest of circumstances, we might find both the solidarity and means of overcoming oppression. Humor is often categorized as a weapon of the weak, but this satire took the offensive. Rather than being a mere coping mechanism, it was a direct attempt to alter the political consciousness of the American people. Over time, this method of critique helped to establish the soul and rationale of the anti-war movement, its messages joining together the experiences of student radicals, hippies, and veteran soldiers as they forged communities dedicated to ending the violence and finding a new way of life. Studying unconventional methods of protest can help us develop new insights into the possibilities for creative political expression. But more so, and more importantly, it helps us understand how they can be used to instigate the reevaluation of social norms and the development of potential alternatives. Thank you. Next, we have Aishigo Kayagil from sociology. Mic check. Who is the authentic real Turk? How do we understand when we see one? Well, she's imagined as a native Turkish speaker and a Sunni Muslim. But is that all? Here's a little story. In May 2007, a group of black Turks were traveling from Izmir, Turkey to a nearby town to attend the Kalf Festival, a traditional uh, annual celebration for the black community in Turkey. They were stopped at a highway checkpoint by the Turkish police who thought that two busloads of black people traveling in Turkey must have been undocumented African immigrants. One of the travelers in the buses was the founder of the Afro-Turk Association, and he explained to the police that the travelers were in fact Afro-Turks headed to the celebration grounds. Surprised to hear that, the police let them go only after checking their IDs and still in disbelief. This incident is one of the many instances in which black Turks are treated as foreigners on the assumption that they're either African immigrants or African American tourists. Historians, however, tell us that their ancestors were brought to the Ottoman Empire as slaves throughout a 400-year period. Despite their long-standing presence, today's citizens of the Turkish Republic have until recently remained invisible both in official historiography and in scholarly research. Hence, the policemen were baffled. Black Turks have been traditionally identified as Arabs, and it is only since the establishment of the association that they started calling themselves Afro-Turks. So in my dissertation project, I ask one, how do Afro-Turks identify during a time of increased institutional awareness, meaning after the association was founded? And two, how do Afro-Turks negotiate their identities through the other identities? So how they negotiate identities through uh, in the topography of ethnic and religious identities in Turkey? And three, how do racial discourses play out in the making of hegemonic Turkishness? So I collected data over three years through participant observation in events like the Kalf Festival, in-depth interviews with Afro-Turks, and archival research. With the material I collected, I'm drawing a long socio-historical arc, speaking to the emerging literature on legacy of slavery in Turkey, as well as to other cases around the world, such as Afro-Iranians, Afro-Mexicans. Black Turks um, do local dances, they wear traditional headscarf, they are native Turkish speakers and they are Sunni Muslims. But because of their skin color, they are expected to prove their Turkishness in their everyday interactions, along with dealing with variety of microaggressions. Therefore, their experience crystallizes the significance of race as an integral yet subtle element in the making of hegemonic Turkishness. Addressing the lack of research conducted on a community that's been politically and socially marginalized, my project also speaks to critical race theory in terms of opening new routes of ethnic, racial and national conceptualizations. Thank you. Next, we have Alison Jane Martignano from Psychology. Other research not scientists do this. I suggested that maybe this is due to the different types of empathy we study, 
Crediting uh, <laughs> articles that didn't measure empathy, didn't include uh, an intervention of those realities, and it didn't have a comparison group, I ended up with only 44 articles. Luckily, in these articles, there were 105 relevant effect sizes. I entered these effect sizes into a random effect method analysis, and this statistical procedure allowed me to conclude that overall, yes, virtual reality does have a small and significant positive impact on empathy. However, importantly, <laughs> This differs depending on the type of entity. Virtual reality has a large effect on emotional and effective entity, but actually no significant effect on cognitive entity. I propose that this is because of the different amounts of effort required for each type of entity. I suppose the cognitive entity is like a muscle. It requires effort to understand what somebody else is going through, and effort to put yourself in their perspective. If we rely on virtual reality technology to do this work for us, we end up Losing an opportunity to practice this skill. Further support for this suggestion comes from looking at the different control groups used in the study. So virtual reality was more effective than no treatment at all, but it wasn't more effective than just reading about someone else's experience or being told to take someone else's perspective. This suggests that experiences that you improve our skills don't necessarily have to be more immersive or more realistic. Our final contestant is Vivian Kedari, psychology. My heart is going super fast right now, and it's going super fast because I decided to do this ridiculously stressful thing. <laughs> but when it's over, I'm going to take a deep breath, and my heart rate is going to slow. And the reason why it's going to do that is because, is because our nervous system has the ability to speed up or slow down our heart rate to meet the demands of the situations that we're in. And we can measure how effective the nervous system is at doing this by looking at something called heart rate variability, which is the change in heart rate that happens from one beat to the next. HRV, or heart rate variability, can be a measure of psychological well-being because research shows that if we're under psychological distress, our HRV tends to be very low, and this can impact our health. So why am I talking about this? For my dissertation, I'm testing the effectiveness of a psychoeducation intervention meant to teach Syrian refugees about the psychobiological consequences of forced migration. Syrian refugees have been shown to have very high stigma about mental illness, which can prevent them from engaging with the mental health services that are available to them. I, I wonder whether providing people with explanations about symptoms that is centered on the body is a way to give them a, uh, a means through which to express their distress in a way that is helpful and culturally sanctioned. So how am I going to know, though, if my intervention works if my sample isn't willing to say whether they are in, in psychological distress or not, enter heart rate variability. So my team just finished collecting a baseline data for a sample of 160 Syrian refugees residing in Jordan. We had them complete mental health questionnaires and we collected five minutes heart rate to measure their heart rate variability. Right now, on baseline, what the sample shows is that there is very little correspondence between what their heart rate variability is indicating and what they're indicating in self-report. But right now, there are also over 50% of the sample is also saying uh, just a statement such as being all people who are mentally ill are violent. So right now, it's pretty costly to say that you might be mentally ill. My intervention just begun. So eight weeks from now, when we are done with the psychoeducation, we're going to measure them again. And what I expect to find is an increase in symptoms that increases the correspondence between what the physiology is saying and what the self-report is saying. Hopefully, this, increase will also, this de decrease in stigma 
that is going to be evidenced by this increase in correspondence will then increase engagement with mental health promoting activities. And three months later, when we measure them again, we're hopefully going to see improved markers of physiological and self-reported well-being. Thank you. And if we could just have another round of applause for all of our contestants. Okay, so now all of you who, are, who came in uh, should have had a card on your seat. All right, it's not a gift like you would get on Oprah. It's a card. Uh, and if you could just write the name of your preferred contestant. So we want to thank everybody for taking part in this. I know it required a lot of preparation, probably getting over a lot of nerves. Everyone did a really commendable job. And this, we had a, this is what you have to say, but it's actually true. We had a really difficult job, um, job that is choosing three from among a host of really qualified candidates. Um, but our, uh, I'll go reverse order. So no, reverse order. Number three is Feng Chen. So <laughs> Congratulations, Feng. And number two is Alyssa. Congratulations, Alyssa. And then our number one is Aisha Gould. Congratulations. And According to you, the people, <laughs> uh, the audience choice is also Aisha Gul. <laughs> so congratulations, Fang, <laughs> Alyssa, and Aisha Gul, and also again for the, all the contestants, and thanks everybody for coming out. <laughs>